Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Kidneys play a very important role in the buffering of fixed acids, more specifically in providing plasma bicarbonate for buffering of fixed acids. Maintenance of plasma bicarbonate levels is done by three different mechanisms operating in the kidney. The fixed acids would protonate in plasma and the protons of fixed acids will consume plasma bicarbonate and get eliminated therefore. The bicarbonate for buffering of fixed acids is provided from the distal tubules of the kidney, a phenomenon called generation of bicarbonate in the distal tubule. In addition, the kidneys are also concerned with filtration and therefore elimination of the fixed acid anions. Why removal of fixed acid anions is important for maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels is something we will see at the end of the session. The third role of the kidney in maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels is reabsorption of filtered bicarbonate. We will consider these three mechanisms in this session starting with reabsorption of filtered bicarbonate. The graphics will be different for the session and therefore bear with me for repetition. Carbon dioxide is handled by red blood cells and the acidity of carbon dioxide is managed by hemoglobin till the carbon dioxide is reformed within the red blood cells and eliminated in the lungs. Carbon dioxide is therefore called a volatile acid. The non-volatile or fixed acids cannot be blown off in the lungs and therefore they are called fixed acids. The protons of the fixed acids react with plasma bicarbonate and that's how these protons are removed from plasma. This session is about the role of the kidney in maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels. If I pose this question to a fresher batch, that is, what they think is the source of bicarbonate for buffering the fixed acid protons, a common answer that I would get is, Bicarbonate is formed by erythrocytes and that can be used for buffering of fixed acid protons. That is not a correct answer because the bicarbonate that is formed by erythrocytes is reclaimed by erythrocytes in the pulmonary circulation to eliminate the carbon dioxide. And that bicarbonate, which we can think of as the erythrocyte bicarbonate, is not available for buffering the fixed acid protons. The bicarbonate that is available for buffering fixed acid protons comes from the kidneys. So we can think of this fraction as the renal bicarbonate and this as the erythrocyte bicarbonate. What is in purple would be the bicarbonate concentration in arterial blood and as blood moves through the veins, more bicarbonate is added into venous blood. It is easy to understand why generation of bicarbonate in the distal tubule and reabsorption of the filtered bicarbonate are important for maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels. It is less obvious as to why elimination of the fixed acid anions is important for maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels. The fixed acid anions are filtered and go out unreabsorbed and that function is important for maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels. We will see why. One word of caution is that phosphate is different from the other fixed acid anions because there is another important source of phosphate coming into blood that is from bone resorption and also dietary phosphate. So phosphate levels are fairly higher and phosphate is also reabsorbed in the proximal tubule and reabsorption of phosphate in the proximal tubule is 
regulated by parathyroid hormone. We will see that as we go. If you can think of phosphate differently from the rest of the fixed acid anions, we can group all the fixed acid anions together and say that they go out unreabsorbed in the kidney. And that function is important for maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels. We will see these functions one by one and we will start with reabsorption of bicarbonate in the proximal tubule. Parts of the nephron, Bowman's capsule, proximal tubule, loop of Henle, distal tubule, collecting duct, afferent arteriole, glomerulus afferent arteriole. The efferent arteriole continues and then it winds around the PCT and DCT to form what are called peritubular capillaries before ending in the renal vein. And then we have the proximal and distal tubular cells. Bicarbonate reabsorption occurs in the proximal tubular cell and that's what we will consider first. Bicarbonate is freely filtered in the glomerulus. Therefore, you will have bicarbonate at a concentration equal to the concentration in the plasma, 24 millimoles per liter. How is this reabsorbed? Are there bicarbonate transporters in the luminal border of the proximal tubular cell so that bicarbonate can be reabsorbed? There are bicarbonate transporters. We've got the anion exchanger, which is the chloride bicarbonate exchanger in red blood cells, for example. Then there is the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter. There are bicarbonate transporters in the body. And the question is, is there a bicarbonate transporter in the luminal border of the proximal tubular cell? The answer is no. And then how can bicarbonate be reabsorbed? The proximal tubular cell, like the erythrocyte, has the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And therefore, this famous forward reaction can go on within proximal tubular cells. And the bicarbonate formed, therefore, is what is given to plasma. But why do we call this process bicarbonate reabsorption? If this forward reaction has to go on unhindered within the proximal tubular cell, the other product of the reaction, which is protons, have to be removed from the cell. The transporter in the cell, which is responsible for removing that proton, is the sodium hydrogen exchanger. If the sodium hydrogen exchanger should continue to remove protons from the cell, then the protons which move into the tubular fluid must be removed. That happens by these protons reacting with the bicarbonate in the tubular fluid to form carbon dioxide. The reverse reaction will go on in the tubule and that is actually accelerated by the presence of a carbonic anhydrase enzyme sticking out into the tubule found in the membrane of the proximal tubular cell sticking out into the tubule, what's called carbonic anhydrase type 2. This is carbonic anhydrase type 4. And the presence of that carbonic anhydrase accelerates the reverse reaction. Carbon dioxide and water will be formed. Carbon dioxide will diffuse back to the cell and water is eliminated. So, you would notice that for every bicarbonate that is given to plasma, one proton should be removed from the cell and that proton combines with one bicarbonate that is present in the tubular fluid and they annihilate each other. Therefore, for every bicarbonate that is given to plasma, one bicarbonate is lost in the tubular fluid and that is why we call this process bicarbonate reabsorption. There is no net gain of bicarbonate, but for every bicarbonate gained, there is one lost in the tubular fluid. There is no net loss or net gain and the process is called bicarbonate reabsorption. Let us now look at the proteins which are important for this process, the carbonic anhydrase enzyme, the sodium hydrogen exchanger and the bicarbonate transporter in the basolateral border of the proximal tubular cell, the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter which has a stoichiometry of 1 sodium is to 3 bicarbonate. That is the transporter which extrudes bicarbonate from the cell and then it enters the capillaries. 
as an academic exercise, we will consider what is the workload of the proximal tubular cell in reabsorbing bicarbonate. We will then compare this with the load of the distal tubular cell. Bicarbonate is freely filtered and the amount of bicarbonate that is filtered will be the GFR per day which is 180 liters and the concentration of bicarbonate in the filtered fluid which works out to nearly 4000 millimoles a day. That is the amount of bicarbonate that will have to be reabsorbed by the proximal tubular cell. In comparison, the distal tubules will have to generate that amount of bicarbonate that is consumed every day for buffering of fixed acids. And the fixed acid output we saw is 50 to 100 millimoles per day and that is the amount that has to be replaced by the distal tubular cell. What I am attempting to say is that the workload of the proximal tubular cell in terms of bicarbonate is much more than the workload of the distal tubular cell. Having learnt about the mechanism of bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubule, we will keep these terms in mind and refer to them again when we discuss pathologies related to plasma pH. A condition called proximal renal tubular acidosis where the bicarbonate reabsorption process fails a condition called Fanconi syndrome and then we will also learn how parathyroid hormone imbalance affects the processes of bicarbonate reabsorption and generation. We will now move on to bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule. The distal tubular cell generates bicarbonate to replace the bicarbonate that is consumed by the protons of the fixed acids. 50 to 100 millimoles of, of fixed acids are formed every day and that amount of bicarbonate will be consumed by the protons every day and that amount has to be replaced by the distal tubular cell every day. We will see how this happens. The process of bicarbonate generation is the same as it happens in the proximal tubular cell. The forward mode of this famous reaction goes on in the distal tubular cell too as it has the enzyme carbonic anhydrase and the bicarbonate formed thereof is given to plasma. Just like in the proximal tubular cell, if this reaction has to proceed, then the protons formed have to be eliminated from the cell. In the proximal tubule, we had the sodium hydrogen exchanger in the luminal border of the proximal tubular cell to extrude the protons. In the distal tubule, we have a proton pump which can extrude the protons. In the session on primary active transporters, we have seen that there are two types of proton pumps, a V-type ATPase and a P-type ATPase. The V-type ATPase is a proton uniport and the P-type proton pump is a proton potassium antiport. Both types are found here, but the major proton pump is the V-type proton pump. V for vesicular, it's generally found on all vesicles within cells, but in the distal tubular cell, the V-type ATPase is found on the plasma membrane as well. This proton pump can push protons against a gradient. Even if the luminal fluid becomes acidic, it can continue to push protons. Does that mean that all the protons that need to be eliminated can be eliminated just by the proton pump? Let us do some calculations here to understand what happens. The pH of urine, when urine comes out, will be about 4.5. In fact, about 5 for ease of calculations, I am taking the more extreme scenario. The pH of urine cannot drop below 4.5 and therefore we understand that that is the limit of this proton pump. Every pump will have a certain gradient against which it can pump. For example, a 5 HP motor can pump 
to a certain height. A 10 HP motor can pump to a greater height. So every pump will have a limitation and so do biological ion pumps. The pH of plasma is 7.4 and the lowest recordable pH in urine is 4.5 to 5 which means that this pump can achieve a thousand times gradient of protons. The difference is about 3 pH units therefore the proton concentration here can be three orders of magnitude higher than the proton concentration in plasma. In plasma the proton concentration is 40 nanomoles per liter and therefore in the tubular fluid this can go up to 40 micromoles per liter. And how much of urine is formed per day? Only about a liter of urine is formed per day and therefore if only the pump was available for proton extrusion only 40 micromoles of protons can be excreted per day. But we know that 50 to 100 millimoles of protons must be eliminated every day so as to generate that much bicarbonate which will provide the bicarbonate necessary for buffering 50 to 100 millimoles of protons coming from fixed acids. Therefore it is obvious that the proton pumps alone are insufficient to achieve the quantum of bicarbonate generation that is required. If the proton pumps have to continue to extrude protons and if the pH should not drop any further then it is obvious that there must be a proton acceptor in the distal tubular fluid. In the proximal tubular fluid we had bicarbonate as the proton acceptor but all the bicarbonate has been reabsorbed in the proximal tubule and for all practical purposes there is no bicarbonate that reaches the distal tubular fluid in the normal circumstances unless there is a need to eliminate bicarbonate by the body. Normally there is no bicarbonate that reaches the distal tubular fluid. So what is the proton acceptor in the distal tubular fluid? The proton acceptor here is phosphates and therefore phosphates are referred to as the urinary buffer. Where do the phosphates come from? Remember there was some phosphate that came from the fixed acid itself. We called it the fixed acid anion then. This is not the only source of phosphate. In fact the total quantum of fixed acids is only 10 micromoles per liter. We did a steady state output calculation and for 50 to 100 millimoles per day output we saw that the steady state output would be 10 micromoles per liter. That is all of them put together. Therefore phosphates per se would be less than 10 micromoles per liter. But the plasma phosphate concentration is about 1 millimole per liter and that phosphate comes from other sources like due to bone resorption. This phosphate is filtered and in the proximal tubule you would learn in renal physiology that there is a sodium phosphate symporter which reabsorbs some phosphate but the remaining phosphate will move to the distal tubular fluid. Is it going to be adequately concentrated? Because in an earlier session we saw that for any system to function as an effective buffer system it must be adequately concentrated in a concentration much higher than the acid insult to the system. So is phosphate going to be adequately concentrated? Yes. because even though some phosphate is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, remember about 180 liters of glomerular filtrate is formed every day and of that only 1 liter per day comes out as urine which means the tubular fluid is concentrated nearly 180 times. Therefore phosphate concentration will be sizable when it reaches the distal tubule and that will function as an effective hydrogen acceptor in the distal tubule. You could now ask the question, why is this phosphate behaving in two different ways in plasma and the distal tubule? Let me explain that question. We saw that phosphate tended to remain ionized in plasma having given off the protons. 
if we look at the phosphate species, there are all these states in which phosphates can occur. It could be partially ionized or fully ionized. In fact, the species that exist in plasma are these two in the ratio 4 is to 1. So you've got a lot more ionized form in plasma. I'm not going to consider this any longer. We'll consider phosphates as phosphates. What I'm trying to say is that phosphates tend to remain ionized, separate from protons in plasma. And that's why those protons had to be buffered. If that was the case, why do we say that? In the distal tubule, phosphates would accept the hydrogen ions and move leftwards. The answer to this is the pK of the phosphate buffer system. It is about 6.8. In the plasma, pH is determined by the bicarbonate carbon dioxide buffer pair. It's fixed at 7.4 and therefore phosphates having a pK of 6.8 will tend to remain ionized, produce more protons so as to pull the pH of the system towards their own pK. But that doesn't happen because this pH is determined by bicarbonate. Therefore, the tendency of phosphates in plasma is to remain ionized. Whereas in the distal tubular fluid, pH is set by the proton pump. pH is 5 and in this state, phosphates will tend to bind protons so as to increase the pH towards their own pK. That is why phosphates function as hydrogen acceptors in urine. Phosphates alone are insufficient because if this pump did not reduce the pH of distal tubular fluid, then phosphates will not function as an effective hydrogen acceptor. So the two together, the proton pump and the urinary buffer function to eliminate as many protons as are required while not permitting the tubular fluid pH to drop below 4.5. We've considered two mechanisms which help in extrusion of protons, the proton pump and the urinary buffer phosphate. Many textbooks would say that there are two urinary buffers, ammonia in addition to phosphate. What would be stated is that ammonia is formed in the proximal tubular cell and would diffuse into the distal tubule, there it would function as a hydrogen acceptor. This may not be possible because the pK of the Ammonia ammonium buffer system is 9.2, which means that wherever ammonia is formed, the pH of body fluids is close to 7.4. So wherever it is formed, immediately it would bind hydrogen ions because its pK is 9.2. In an attempt to bring the pH of the system towards its own pK, Ammonia would immediately bind to hydrogen ions and form ammonium wherever they are formed. And therefore, it is not correct to say that the ammonia formed here can move here and then become a hydrogen acceptor. What even comes into the distal fl tubular fluid will be ammonium. And therefore, it may not be able to function as a hydrogen acceptor in the distal tubule. I go with that school of thought and I would like to believe that the only urinary buffer which is capable of accepting those hydrogen ions is phosphates. Ammonia cannot serve as a urinary buffer because the pK of the ammonia ammonium buffer system is 9.2. However, ammonia generation in the proximal tubule may help preserve plasma bicarbonate in another way. We will consider that later, if possible.
in summary, we have the proton pumps in the luminal border of the distal tubular cell, which extrude protons. And we have the urinary buffers accepting those protons. And these two systems help eliminate protons formed in the cell. And therefore, the reaction can go on and enough bicarbonate can be formed in the distal tubular cell. In addition to these, there is a third and very important mechanism which assists in proton extrusion by the proton pumps. We refer to this phenomenon as what is called a luminal electronegativity. The lumen of the distal tubule is negative with respect to the extracellular fluid. If you put an electrode in the lumen and an electrode outside the cell there, the lumen will be about 6 millivolts negative to the outside. You must be cautious. This negativity is not with respect to the interior of the cell. The interior of the cell is still negative with respect to the exterior as in the case of every other cell. But the lumen per se is negative with respect to the extracellular fluid. The negativity in the lumen attracts more positive ions to go into the lumen. It is a very important factor in assisting the proton pump to extrude protons. Why does this luminal electronegativity come up at all? Now in the lumen, sodium can be reabsorbed by two transporters, a sodium chloride symporter and an epithelial sodium channel, the ENAC. The sodium chloride symporter is an electroneutral transporter. One positive ion and one negative ion go together. Therefore, it does not generate any potential difference. The sodium that moves in, of course, will be extruded from the cell by the sodium potassium pump, which is present in the basolateral border. However, sodium reabsorption via the sodium channels will leave the lumen negative. ENACs are therefore responsible for the luminal electronegativity. So the third factor which helps in bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule is the luminal electronegativity due to sodium reabsorption via ENAC. There are many factors which can affect this luminal electronegativity and therefore disturb bicarbonate generation. The first and foremost is the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone can increase the activity of epithelial sodium channels. In hyperaldosteronism, primary hyperaldosteronism, ENAC activity will be enhanced, therefore luminal electronegativity will be more and that will help pull down more protons than are required. This reaction will go on much more than what is required and more bicarbonate will be given to plasma. Hyperaldosteronism can therefore result in alkalosis. Another condition which can enhance sodium reabsorption via ENACs is inhibition of the other transporter. The sodium chloride symporter is inhibited by thiazide diuretics, for example. And when sodium is not reabsorbed via the sodium chloride symport, all of it will have to be reabsorbed via ENAC and that will enhance the luminal electronegativity, pulling down more protons, generating more bicarbonate than what is required. Therefore, thiazide diuretics can result in alkalosis. Similarly, in the loop of Henle, the tra transporter on the luminal border absorbing sodium is a sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter. A common diuretic, frusamide, acts by inhibiting this transporter. If sodium is not taken out of the tubule at the loop of Henle, all that sodium will arrive at the distal tubule and will have to be reabsorbed by both ENAX and the sodium chloride symporter. Any enhanced transport via ENAX will increase luminal electronegativity, pull down more protons, provide more bicarbonate to plasma, resulting in alkalosis. 
frusamide or what's called the loop diuretic will also result in alkalosis. There is more to this luminal electronegativity. This electronegativity not only pulls down protons but also favors potassium extrusion from the cells. Potassium from the cells will move to the tubule via potassium channels on the luminal border of the distal tubular cell. This is the mechanism to excrete potassium in the body and potassium extrusion is also favored by this luminal electronegativity. Protons and potassium compete with each other for extrusion aided by this electronegativity and therefore if for some reason elimination of one has to increase then the elimination of the other will suffer. Let us take the case where there is hyperkalemia, potassium in the blood has increased. This will result in more potassium being eliminated in the distal tubule and if the luminal negativity were to be the same, the increased extrusion of potassium will result in reduced extrusion of protons and therefore reduced bicarbonate formation. Similarly, if there is hypokalemia, potassium excretion will decrease and the luminal electronegativity will pull more protons, generate more bicarbonate and bicarbonate levels in plasma will go up. A reduced bicarbonate means this an increase in proton concentration in plasma and an increased bicarbonate means hydrogen ion concentration has gone down or the pH has gone up. It is not only at the level of the distal tubular cell that protons and potassium interact. At the level of every cell, protons and potassium regulate each other. If for some reason hydrogen ions go up in plasma or potassium ions go up in plasma, I am just taking one case. If hydrogen ions go up or if there is acidosis, then these protons will translocate into every cell because the proteins within cells can buffer those hydrogen ions just like hemoglobin and red blood cells accepts hydrogen ions. Cellular proteins can accept hydrogen ions. So as a temporary measure in acidosis to prevent the pH from dropping too much, the protons will translocate into cells. When cations move into cells, some cation must move out and what better cation than the one that is predominantly present within the cell? Potassium moves out and therefore there will be an increase in potassium concentration in plasma as well. Here's another reason why acidosis is accompanied by hyperkalemia. The reverse occurs in alkalosis. When there is less hydrogen ions in plasma, hydrogen ions will translocate out of the cells. That will result in potassium uptake by the cells and potassium levels in plasma will drop. Generally, therefore, hyperkalemia and acidosis coexist and hypokalemia and alkalosis coexist, except in one condition where you would find acidosis coexisting with hypokalemia. In fact, two conditions. I will talk about one now. Let us take the case where the proton pumps per se have failed. Proton pump inhibitors, not omeprazole. This one is not sensitive to omeprazole, not that sensitive to omeprazole. But there are a number of drugs which can inhibit the proton pumps in the distal tubule. If this proton pump is inhibited, proton extrusion will not occur sufficiently. Therefore, enough bicarbonate will not be formed and bicarbonate levels will decrease, giving rise to a, an increase in hydrogen ions or a decrease in pH. But because protons did not get extruded, the luminal electronegativity will pull more potassium. There will be potassium loss in urine and therefore potassium levels will drop. Proton pump inhibition, a condition called type 1 distal renal tubular acidosis, 
is the foremost condition where hypokalemia will coexist with acidosis. An exception to the rule that acidosis generally results in hyperkalemia. When proton extrusion is inhibited, acidosis will coexist with hypokalemia. We will see more of this when we consider the different types of metabolic acidosis. In summary, we have considered bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule. The three important mechanisms are presence of proton pumps, the urinary buffer phosphate and sodium reabsorption through ENAX leaving the lumen electronegative. Then we saw three factors which would alter ENAC activity and therefore the luminal electronegativity. These were aldosterone, inhibition of the sodium chloride symporter here, therefore increasing sodium reabsorption through ENAX and inhibition of sodium reabsorption in the loop delivering more sodium to be reabsorbed in the distal tubule, a phenomenon called increased distal salt delivery. Then we saw that potassium and protons compete with each other for extrusion by the distal tubular cell. They compete for the electronegativity. In addition, they also regulate each other at the level of every cell. This knowledge is important to understand many disorders of pH balance. Summarizing thus far, we have seen the details of two renal mechanisms involved in maintenance of bicarbonate levels in plasma, generation in the distal tubule and reabsorption in the proximal tubule. The third role of the kidney in maintaining plasma bicarbonate levels is in the elimination of the fixed acid anions. Why is elimination of these anions important for maintaining plasma bicarbonate is what we will see just now. Elimination of the fixed acid anions per se is easy to understand. They are freely filtered at the glomerulus and are eliminated unreabsorbed. Only if there is renal failure as we call it, a failure of enough filtration, elimination of fixed acid anions will be affected. Otherwise, if glomerular filtration rate is adequate, the fixed acid anions will be filtered and eliminated. If the fixed acid anions are filtered adequately and eliminated, their levels will be within normal limits almost undetectable, less than 1 millimole per liter, provided the formation is also normal. If metabolism is normal, there is no need for too many fixed acids to come into blood. I am moving them there because they are anions and that is why their levels can affect the levels of the other anion which is bicarbonate. The anions in plasma are chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate we already saw was about 1 millimole per liter, the fixed acid anions which is a very minuscule quantity, it is about 10 micromoles per liter. Then another anion in plasma is serum albumin. The total concentration is about 4 grams per deciliter or 40 grams per liter. And all that gives you only 1 millimole per liter, less than 1 millimole per liter in terms of osmolarity. We can call it less than 1 milliosmole per liter. There is no way to estimate the anion contribution due to these. And generally what is done is sodium and potassium is estimated. The cations in plasma is estimated. A serum electrolyte report generally gives sodium, potassium, chloride and bicarbonate. These are all monovalent ions and therefore even in terms of milli equivalence it is the same numbers. The principle of electron neutrality requires that the total number of cations must equal the total number of anions. We have 144 here but we have only 134 anions. 
The inference therefore is the rest of the anions must be due to whatever is unmeasured and normally the predominant unmeasured anion is serum albumin. It is a polyvalent anion and every gram per deciliter of serum albumin will yield about 2.5 milliequivalents per liter of anions and therefore serum albumin alone can account for this gap in anions. The total measured cations minus the total measured anions will give us the unmeasured anions or what is called the anion gap and in the normal circumstances albumin alone can account for the anion gap. You would notice that we have omitted calcium in our calculations which is about 1 millimole per litre and we have omitted the anion phosphate from our calculations, they balance out each other. Now if for some reason this class of anions increases in plasma, the two important conditions are diabetic ketoacidosis where keto acid output is much more, much more than the ability of the kidney to eliminate them. The kidney even if it functions maximally is overwhelmed by, by the amount of keto acids coming into blood and therefore cannot eliminate all of them. In that condition keto acids can build up in blood or formation of the fixed acids may be normal, all of them put together. In the case of renal failure where the glomerular filtration rate is less than normal, less than 60 ml per minute, normally it is 125 ml per minute and the definition of renal failure is that GFR is less than 60 ml per minute. So when the GFR is less than half, elimination of the fixed acid anions which are normally formed will be reduced and that will lead to a build up of fixed acids in plasma. So if fixed acids build up in plasma, the other anions will have to compensate. Bicarbonate concentration will reduce because the kidneys will eliminate some bicarbonate to bring down the bicarbonate concentration so as to compensate for the increase in unmeasured anions, fixed acid anions. Bicarbonate concentration will reduce and the chloride concentration might also reduce. If you read a lab report now which will only give you sodium, potassium, chloride and bicarbonate as serum electrolytes, these go as unmeasured anions, you will see that you have an anion gap of 26. If you have measured serum albumin, it will be available as 4 grams per deciliter, then you know 10 milliequivalents per liter of this is accounted for by albumin, but there is another 16 which is unexplained and therefore you realize there is an increase in fixed acid anion concentration in plasma. This could be lactates, sulfates, keto acids or poisoning, salicylate poisoning for example can increase the fixed acid anion concentration in plasma. The unmeasured anions are what we refer to as the anion gap because the fixed acid anions compete for anion space with bicarbonate, any increase in fixed acid anions will reduce bicarbonate levels and therefore affect pH and therefore kidneys must have an adequate glomerular filtration rate to filter and therefore eliminate the fixed acid anions. This has been a long session and it is time to summarize. Kidneys help maintain plasma bicarbonate levels so as to buffer the protons released by fixed acids in three ways. Plasma bicarbonate is maintained by reabsorption in the proximal tubule, generation in the distal tubule and by eliminating the fixed acid anions. Thank you for watching.